home for a conversation about the state of storytelling. Please welcome author Tom Parada and Atlantic staff writer Sophie Gilbert. Excited to be talking with you about Tracy Flick and what someone pointed out is her spiritual home of Washington, D.C. <laughs> That's where, where she wants to be. I know. Um, I think we'll jump right in. What made you want to revisit Tracy Flick at this moment? Well, I had the very unusual experience um, as a writer of creating a character who really took on a life of her own um, in two different ways. The first was that you know, Tracy existed on the page and then Reese Witherspoon played her in the wonderful movie in 1999. And she was so good that I think she created an archetype that made its way into the culture. And so um, almost every ambitious national politician who was a woman was compared to Tracy Flick, and not always nicely. You know, <laughs> Tracy got this reputation for being abrasive and unpleasant. And I think particularly um, those attributes um, were applied to Hillary Clinton. She became a kind of a Tracy Flick figure. There were internet memes that had uh, you know, Hillary as Tracy and, and uh, Obama as Paul, you know, the, yeah. the golden boy who gets to float above the fray while she has to do the, the gritty work of, of politics. Um, and then after that, I think um, some critics uh, uh, rediscovered Tracy and said, wait a second, you know, she is not, Tracy's not a villain. Yeah. In fact, Tracy is a victim. And it was a, a kind of a feminist revision of Tracy, which was interesting because I don't think Tracy herself as a character would like the idea that she was a victim. She really um, wanted to feel powerful and, and feel like a, somebody who could win. And, um, you know, so that, that was, she was in the air mm -hmm. and she belonged to the culture more than to me. But then Me Too happened. And anyone who's read the book Election um, or seen the movie knows that Tracy had um, a, a sexual relationship with a teacher and she was very defiant about it in the book. Mm -hmm. And I wondered as a, writer if I had been fair to her. And I, and I went back and, and reread the book. And I, I just wanted, you know, I know that I think about issues of consent and power relationships very differently now than I thought about them in the 1990s. And I wondered if Tracy did too. Wow. And that was part of what Tracy Flick Can't Win was about, was a middle-aged Tracy Flick looking back at her life and thinking about, um, things that happened to her in high school and, and how they had you know, affected her, her life in the long run. You talked about um, the sort of duality of Tracy. She exists in the book and she exists in the movie. But the movie, I think, was optioned before the book was even out. Is that right? Yeah. I, so Election is kind of my Cinderella story because it was, I, I'd written three books that, that weren't published and that was one of them. Mm -hmm. And finally, one of them got published and I read from a book at, at a conference that was in progress that wasn't election. And, and a person there was a screenwriter said, you should talk to these producers. I think they would like your book. And my book wasn't done, but I talked to the producers and I said, I have this book in my drawer um, that I can't get published. It, because everyone thought it was, it felt like a young adult novel. It was a yeah. book about a high school election, but it was full of sex and, and politics. And so it didn't make sense as a young adult book. Um, anyway, they said they would like to take a look. And at that point in the late 90s, Hollywood was making a lot of dark teen movies. And Election kind of really fit into that. And so the book got published only because it was already becoming a movie. Oh. But what was it like as a writer having created this character who you then see on, on screen in this kind of really, <laughs> really enduring and powerful performance? Did that change the way that you thought about Tracy at all? Did it color your perception of her? Um, 
Well, it certainly made me respect the power of, of film. Yeah. And it changed my career. I started to do a lot of screenwriting myself and got very interested in making film and TV because I'd always dreamed of writing books that would be part of a cultural conversation. It seemed like one of the reasons to, to be a novelist. And the fact was that until my work was made into really good movies and, and TV shows, um, it, you know, I think it, it connected with individual readers, but it was not like a subject of a cultural conversation. And so um, I think that, that part of it really was illuminating to me. Um, and, you know, I think some writers don't, don't care about that, uh, you know, as much maybe as I did, but I, I, it really felt, I wanted to reach a wide audience and it felt like I could do that more through these adaptations than I, I could have through just writing my books. Yeah. Was there anything, um, when you returned to Tracy, did you reread Election? Do you reread your own novels? <laughs> yeah, well, I had to in this case because yeah. I knew that it was sort of the war text and, and Tracy Flick Can't Win was going to be in a conversation with Election. And, you know, one of the things, it, it actually was a little bit of a relief to me. Like, I thought maybe that I had written these sex scenes in a way that would make me cringe. And, and I, it it didn't. I mean, it felt like I really was um, gave Tracy some vulnerability in in those scenes, and um, and I understood that it wasn't me sort of projecting onto her a certain kind of defiance. I realized like Tracy was getting her energy from a certain kind of feminism that was um, really strong in, in the early '90s. You know, I, re I noticed that there were many allusions to Madonna in the book and and that that sort of you know when you think about feminism now it, it's very focused on trauma and mm. um, you know protecting women and I think back then there was a much sort of bolder and, and powerful um, current in feminism which was you know you could behave like a man you can get whatever you want you can do whatever you want and I think Tracy was plugged into that mm. kind of power feminism to, to I'm sure there's another <laughs> word for it um, and, and I think in Tracy Flick can't win we meet Tracy she's a middle-aged assistant principal she hasn't fulfilled her dreams of, of a political career and she's looking back and and starting to realize that it, you know that she wasn't as extraordinary an individual as, as she believed, um, and that there was something systemic about that she was a kind of um, representative woman rather than a unique yeah. um, super, uh, superhero. Why did you want to place her in that context? Because I think at the end of the movie, which differs from, from the book, she's working in Washington, she's working for a Republican senator, and um, she seems to sort of be on this powerful path, like this girl bossery trajectory. What made you want to not have her on that course? You know, uh, I, I think I'm, I'm really interested in ambition as a subject, but I also feel like um, even for people who have achieved a lot. I think dissatisfaction with where you are mm. is um, a kind of a universal human experience. And it's something that, that has really interested me as a writer. And, and um, I don't know, it just, it just felt right to say that, um, you know, there's a Tracy Flick in every high school. And not everybody ends up being, you know, the senator from New Jersey. Um, and, and I, I want, you know, she's, a, she's got a PhD, she's a professional, she owns a home, she has a child. In, by every ordinary human standard, she's a success. But she did not, her goals weren't ordinary. And so she, she feels like a failure. And so, like many middle-aged people, she's looking at her life and saying, how do I account for the discrepancy between what I dreamed of and what I got? Yeah. It's interesting, too, because, um, like, as you mentioned, we're in this period of revisionism, thinking about women in the 90s in the public eye who were not treated fairly. And certainly the reception to Tracy at the time, particularly to the way that she was played in the movie, was, um, was quite hostile, <laughs> shall we say. Um, so it was interesting to me reading Tracy Flick Can't Win that in some ways the culture has not evolved that much. Like, she's still not in a 
world that appreciates her talents, that has come to appreciate women that are powerful, ambitious strivers. Um, and I, I, in some ways, it's, it is a progression for her, but it's not quite what we would want. No, and, and it, Tracy Flick can't win. It's in the title, you know, it, you can hear it. I mean, it really was a, a reaction to the 2016 election. There, there was just that sense somehow that um, the culture did not have a paradigm for what a female leader would look like. And, and to the point, you know, where like the most toxic version of a male leader um, was able to win over uh, the much more qualified, intelligent, <laughs> competent person, you know, and I, and I did feel like there was just some sense that, that we haven't gotten there yet. We have not found our, our, our paradigm. And, and then this was one lesson to me about Tracy. One of the reasons she became a kind of um, archetype was that there were not fictional representations of female politicians. Um, we didn't have female politicians, you know. I mean, there are a few outliers in the, you know, in American history. But, it, uh, I, you know, when I wrote Election in the Early 90s, I, I'm not sure that I had read a book or seen a movie about a, a woman who was a political leader. Yeah. You just realize how recent the, the history is in, in that sense. And I don't, you know, we have to find that paradigm, we have to, to build it. But, um, yeah. and it may be something that all, some of us may not like, um, you know, if, uh, well, I, I, you know, well, I mean, Mar Margaret Thatcher certainly exists yeah. um, as a, and, and that's, that's a very <laughs> old sort of, you know, paradigm of, of the woman who has, you know, kind of, uh, gotten beyond femininity or, or eliminated a certain kind of femininity, like yeah. the Iron Lady. Yeah, I like guess. the Queen too in some ways. Yeah. Um, what is it about the landscape of American suburbia and high schools in particular that feels like such fertile terrain for you? Like what interests you about that setting? Yeah, you know, I, I write about teachers all the time and I write about high school quite a bit and, and sometimes I'm a little embarrassed about that. Um, but I've, I've gotten older, I just realized there are some writers who just have a, a subject, you know. Um, Philip Roth just kept going back to Newark um, in, in different ways. And, and the way he treated it changed over the course of his career. But that small place as his subject never, never changed. And for me, I think there are a couple things. Um, so I, I went to a working class uh, public high school in, in New Jersey, and then I went to Yale. And so I had the culture shock of, you know, um, going from quote unquote real America to elite America. Mm. Um, and it, it, it did make me feel like, oh, that, that was America. That was the last time I belonged to like a broad community. And, and it, it has stuck with me as a kind of um, microcosm yeah. For America, and, and you see it now in our politics, by the way, right? Um, what gets taught in high school, um, you know, uh, whether whether it's critical race theory or um, you know, uh, gender identity or um, sex education, um, these are, are burning political issues, and that you know, certainly they uh, influence the governor's election, and most recently in, in Virginia, but are also going to be very prominent in the midterm. So I, I, I think that our democracy actually often happens at this level of um, the school. And the school is the place where like our one generation tries to <laughs> pass on values to another generation uh, during a time of like huge cultural change. And yeah. I think it's, um, there is something about that space that, that feels like um, you know, people say, oh, the states are laboratories of democracy, but I think like public schools are real laboratories of, of democracy. And, and there's something about the position of the teacher, you know, that really interests me. Um, yeah. I, I think it's um, in the same way, I guess you could write about, um, you know, clergy as well or something, you know, just this idea of these very imperfect people trying to do this impossible job um, seems like a really, important human story. Yeah. 
Um, I wanted to talk to you about women. Uh, there's a theme here. <laughs> you have um, the most amazing, abiding sympathy and empathy for all your characters, even the really, really crappy ones. Um, but you seem, I think, particularly attuned to how much harder life can be for your female characters, whereas the men, I think, often like are born into privilege or luck or blessings that they don't always appreciate. Um, so how do you research your female characters? Like, how do you get inside their heads? And do you think there are common threads between them? So, you know, when I started, I, I was um, often grouped with Nick Hornby as a kind of, <laughs> in, in, there would be a table at the bookstore called Lad Lit. Yeah. Because <laughs> um, I wrote a book about a, a wedding band, who, these rock musicians who played in a wedding band. And I think that, but also my first book, Bad Haircut, is about all about male friendship. and. Election was actually the book that changed it for me. I wanted to tell this story from a multitude of perspectives in first person, so that meant I had to create uh, believable women characters. And um, you know, now there's a very fraught uh, discussion in, in literary circles about who can tell what stories and when you can step outside of your own identity. And, and it wasn't fraught in that way when I did it, it was, but it was fraught as a literary a uh, challenge for me. Like, can I, uh, as, as a man, you know, create a believable woman character? And I think I just did what actors do, which was try to find some part of me that connected with some part of that character. So for Tracy, um, you know, I was connecting with that part of me that was ambitious and felt like I was coming from nowhere and, and had to, um, you know, fight for everything, you know, and, and um, and then Tammy, who's the other character in Election, she's the um, young uh, queer woman who is sort of the Ross Perot of that story. Mm -hmm. She's the uh, subversive candidate. And for her, I you know, tried to give her all of my, you know, sort of sardonic, wise guy, um, whatever part of my personality w was there. And, you know, I wrote that book, and, and especially with Tracy, you know, um, I would for years after I would do book groups and, and women would come up to me and just say, you know, I, I was Tracy. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, um, and they weren't saying I was, you know, abrasive and unpleasant. They were saying I was the girl with her hand up. I was the one who was trying really hard. I was the one who was president of all the clubs. I, um, you know, I believed I could conquer the world. And, and they were, and I, I thought, okay, I wrote a character who, um, people felt seen by. Um, and it gave me a certain kind of confidence to, to start to write these women characters. Um, I think like Little Children um, was, was a book that had, uh, it was about a, a, a stay-at-home mom and a stay-at-home stay dad who starred an affair at the, the local pool. And, and um, I, what I'm really, I think, writing about is is the way that um, feminism is sort of making its way through our intimate lives over the past several decades. You know, because I remember being in college and, and my generation was this post-Roe v. Wade generation. And um, I think we thought we could remake marriage into a more fair institution, I, you know, women could join the workforce and have careers. And you know, in many ways, these things have happened over time, but they've happened slowly and imperfectly. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, equality is always this uh, thing that's shimmering over here just beyond our actual lives. Um, but, but you know, how feminism has <coughs> empowered women, destabilized marriage, um, forced men to change or not, you know, resist. Um, has really been the subject, I think, of, of a lot of my work, as, as well as you know, teachers and schools. Those are my, my go-to spots. Yeah. I think we have to leave it here. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you.